Hello and welcome to my channel. I've been growing colocations now for about 12 years in the UK, which in general gets cold and wet winters. So most of the plants that I grow will need overwintering in different ways. So today I'd like to concentrate more on the tender varieties. These are the ones that come from quite tropical climates and generally need to be kept ticking over at certain temperatures to keep them going. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically give you some tips and ideas that I've learned over the years because I've had good and bad results. But some of the tips that have worked for me and will hopefully help anyone that wants to go to this nightmare of overwintering colocasias in these colder climates and help them get through it. So just a brief thing first. This is just a summer house stroke cabin at the bottom of my garden which is insulated i'm using sansy grow lights to help overwinter these the room is generally kept at about 15 degrees it's a little bit warmer now it's at 18 degrees some of these plants are on um, propagator bases giving them bottom heat which is helping them sort of keep them growing general rule is you don't really want them to grow too much. You just want them to sort of slowly tick over, maybe push out the odd leaf now and again, because otherwise they're just going to grow tall, weak plants that as soon as you have to put out are going to cause you problems. Um, I tend to keep them in here because I can monitor the temperatures better. In the greenhouse, it fluctuates way too much. It goes from just below zero Celsius to 20 degrees if the sun's out and the plants do not know what they want to do. They don't know if they want to go dormant or whether they want to start growing. Whereas in here, I can keep these varieties just ticking over, keep the temperatures quite sort of even and hopefully have some success at getting most of them through. So... Let's start with number one, and probably the most important factor when thinking how to overwinter colocasia, variety. This will determine on whether you are dry storing it, whether it's hardy and you can leave outside, whether you need to try and keep it going and on a sunny windowsill or under grow lights. Variety is everything with colocasia when it comes to overwintering. So today I'm concentrating more on the tender varieties, which come from more tropical countries and don't really go dormant in their natural climate. These tend to need a little bit more heat and light just to keep them ticking over. So whatever you do, the first thing you should think of is what variety am I growing? And general rules are if they are the black leafed varieties or variegated varieties, most of these tend to need um, a little bit more heat to keep them happy some of them will have corms and can be dry stored but you often find with these more tropical plants they are really hard to get going again so for me once you've determined the variety of the colocasia you're growing then you can figure out the best method to do it number two colocasias do not like to be kept indoors Compared to alocasias, which actually make quite good houseplants, colocasias just demand much higher light levels. So unless you've got them under some type of grow light, like I have here, or you can give them a really sunny windowsill, um, they generally start to deteriorate. You will see them slowly lose leaves, probably go down to one leaf because the humidity will be lower, especially if you've got central heating. And it's just much harder to control the water levels, the light levels and everything inside. So general rule is colocasias do not make good houseplants. There are exceptions and people can treat them the way um, they prefer with maybe a bit of extra sort of kit. But generally they do not like to be houseplants. So, number three, temperature. What temperature are you going to keep these plants at 
whether they're going to be in a cool greenhouse, whether they are a hardy variety and can be kept in the ground or on a kitchen windowsill. The temperature will determine on how you look after these plants. So for instance, these tender ones here, this room is kept generally around 15 degrees. It is a little bit warmer today because lots of these tender colocations will start to go dormant under about 12. 15 keeps them wanting to grow. 20 pushes them even more with extra water. But in general, if you can keep them above 15, they should stop themselves from going dormant. I had a day where, two days actually, where it dropped down for some reason, the heater didn't work during the cold freeze we had, and it got down to about eight degrees in here, um, actually seven. So a few of the plants like Colocasia Ferro's mask and Black Magic really didn't like that and started to sort of drop their leaves and go dormant. Well, now I've got them back on the heat mat, they're sort of uh, starting to pick up. So temperature will determine how much you water them, how much light they need, various factors. So it is a key point. If it's 20 degrees, you're gonna have to water more often than you are at 15. It's just, you know, as basic as that, to be fair. Number four, soil mix. I tend to use a really free draining soil mix on most of my really tender colocations. So that could be a mixture of perlite and compost, or sometimes I use these clay pebbles. And what I tend to do is if the corn hasn't got much root, I will put these clay pebbles around the corn in the top half of the pot, but the bottom half will be a mix of compost and perlite, probably at a ratio of at least probably 40% perlite. Now, it's well known that colocasias love water, but this tends to be when temperatures are warm in the summer. In the overwintering process, you really need to sort of stop them from being able to rot. The corms will rot very simply just by being over wet if they're not, if temperatures aren't high enough and enough light for them to grow. So they can be a lot of hassle, but by using this sort of mix, so this is a new mix I've tried with these clay pebbles at the top half and compost at the bottom mixed with perlite, what it does is they tend to root down into the mix at the bottom where they can get a little bit of moisture and nutrients, but actually surrounding the corms is just the pebbles which drain so freely that it tends to keep the corm much drier and less likely to rot. You can get root rot, but generally the bottom of the corm will be where it wants to rot first. So whenever starting colocations, to be fair, whichever variety, even if they're cold tolerant varieties, I would always use as small a pot as possible that I can fit them in and I would use a really free draining mix. If you just have a corm and you want to start them off, well, that's a different subject. There's different methods. You can use them in a tub with sphagnum moss. Um, there's quite a few different methods and that's maybe for a different, more in-depth video. But generally, if, if you use a free draining mix and as these get bigger, I won't pot them up until they are well rooted in. And then I would only pot them up just to the next size. Because even if you plant them out in the summer in a nice big pot, you know that the corm is still surrounded by a really free draining mix. Even if they put their roots down into a really sort of um, organic mix that you may have potted them up into, around the corm should drain free. Because you may get, especially in like the UK, it can be a week of 25 degrees Celsius, and then the next week it could be 15 and wet. So they've got to adapt to that and sit there all soggy and wet and cold, especially near the end of the season when the, the nights just get so much colder and they really just don't enjoy sitting in that wet. They tend to do much better 
if you start them off in a free draining mix and it gives you potential then to at least keep the corms having less chance of rot. Tip number five, light. If you're keeping these indoors, unless on a self-phasing window, which gets lots of natural sunlight, you're gonna have to supplement the light. So for me, over the years, I've just used these different Sansi light bulbs. That one I think is a 35 watt, I can't really remember. And these are probably 15 watt. That is enough light to keep these happy enough just to keep them growing in these conditions. Come summer, different varieties of colocasia prefer different amounts of lights level. Tends to be that these really tropical ones, if they're given plenty of water, will do really well in full sun. Some of the cooler varieties tend to like just a little bit of shade. Um, otherwise it can sort of burn the leaves but it all does depend on different factors how much water they've got and the amount of direct sunlight and if you're in a country like the uk sunlight isn't guaranteed so a lot of colocations are planted out in sunnier spots than they may be done in tropical countries because it's about the only way you're going to get them to grow so light levels is really important for colocations especially compared to alocasia which can do much better in shadier conditions. Number six, watering. Watering will depend on lots of the other factors, how free draining your mix is, how much light the plant is getting, what variety it is. So for me in general, on most of these plants, how often I water, I just assess the plants. So I look at um, how they're doing. I may water every couple of days if they're looking a little dry, it may go a week it really depends on how i'm keeping them and how they're looking i tend to use rainwater um, which i collect and i leave in these bottles i then rotate them on the heat mat because then i increase the temperature of the water so when i water these plants the temperature doesn't fluctuate from being hot to cold all the time i'm just trying to find a steady medium that can literally not shock them into sort of maybe dormancy or even extra growth. I'm just trying to keep everything steady. Now, as I'm saying all these details, I know this all sounds a lot of hassle, but in general, most people that are growing these will maybe have two on the windowsill or under one grown light. And if you've got the mix right, just monitor the water and maybe have a tray underneath and water into the tray because then the roots take up the water but the corm isn't sat in it so that's a really good idea for a couple of these colocations. I know I have a lot of varieties here and I have a lot more in my greenhouse um, being slightly cooler um, and I feel like even as I'm talking it sounds like a lot of hassle but if you can just pick up a few little tips that help you along the way um, hopefully it will help. So I do tend to mist these with rainwater in a little sprayer as well. Um, if you didn't know, the glossy leafed ones tend to hold water a lot much more than the matte leaf ones. Matte leaf ones tend to, unless probably got pests or spider mite, tend to repel the water. So it's quite hard to keep them wet, which obviously helps prevent pests like spider mite. But still worth doing because it surrounds the area in sort of humidity which you know just keeps them a bit greener and lusher number seven bottom heat this isn't essential especially for a lot of colocations and if you're keeping them inside your house your room might be at 20 sort of degrees anyway but especially for a lot of these small plants it really helps i've just got basic propagators here nothing too special set up onto thermostat and I generally just try to keep them at 20 odd degrees. If I was trying to start them off as corms, then I would probably have it nearer to 30 degrees with a propagator lid on. So definitely starting off corms, I think that you sort of realistically will need bottom heat. But if you're just trying to keep them ticking over, then it's not necessarily essential, especially inside the house. But 
for me, because this is down the bottom of my garden in this sort of cabin type thing, um, it can get very cold outside. Maybe the heater sometimes struggles to keep it at temperature and the bottom heat just keeps them happy. So bottom heat isn't essential, but definitely unless you're starting off colocasia, but realistically it can help. Number eight, airflow. If you're in a room like this, which isn't getting any sort of natural air circulation, it's worth having a fan. It doesn't have to be on all the time, but with the humidity and the heat, you're quite often gonna get sort of rot or fungal problems. So every now and again, I will turn that on or set it maybe on a timer just to sort of circulate and get the air flowing round because this will help on like leaves like this where you start to get a little bit of rot if you get anything like that around the stem or the base it's worth just picking it off having sort of good housekeeping try and keep them clean and tidy and get anything that can rot or potentially you know kill these colocasias so get the air circulating um if you're in a house, you might not need this. The house might be really well ventilated anyway. But for me in here, I do need a certain amount of airflow to try and stop different funguses and that may be taking over. So number nine, humidity. Realistically, if you can keep the humidity higher, probably in here, I have it in the 80s, but in a house that would be quite hard to achieve unless you've got humidifier but i'm trying i know that i'm already suggesting all this kit and caboodle for how i do it but i'm trying to make it more basic so if you can keep the humidity maybe over sort of 55 60 percent it may help with pests and controls um pest control i should say so and the plant will just be a little bit healthier for it because they don't tend to like the dry air. It will make them probably go down to sort of one leaf. So in general, colocasias per stem only tend to carry three to four leaves. So when you see a big clump of colocasia, it will have lots of stems. See, this is a single stem and it tends to only have about three leaves on it. Now, as the newer ones come out, the older ones will die. This is absolutely normal. But when overwintering and keeping them inside, you may find that you can only keep them with low humidity at one leaf per time. And as the new one comes out, the other one drops off. So if you can give them that higher bit of humidity, they will thank you for it. So number 10, and usually my worst problem and one of the worst problems with keeping plants indoors, pests, especially colocasia and the sap sucking pests that love to damage them. And the number one culprit, red spider mite. I'm not going to go into depth into red spider mite treatments because there is many videos out there on what to do. But if you can keep the humidity sort of higher that really helps i tend to wipe these leaves down quite a lot with a sort of wet sponge and some of the rainwater. and i often quite go through different ones on different days and just giving them a good wipe over i mist regularly and i don't seem to be in here getting any real infestations i haven't noticed any problems um I'm actually going to get myself a magnifying glass, hopefully this week, so I can just have a good look over them. But red spider mite is an absolute nightmare. In temperatures, especially sort of over 20 degrees Celsius, they, you know, they become so invasive that they're just going to wipe out your whole collection or even just one plant. They will, the leaf will be covered in white sort of webbing. Um and they will just slowly deteriorate the plant. So pest wise, if you can keep the humidity higher, if you can keep them happy and you know, good cleanliness, it's sort of hopefully manageable. But like I say, I'm not gonna go too much into treatments because 
you could go on all day really and there's plenty of information out there and homemade concoctions and sprays you can buy but the weaker the plant you know the more likely they're going to suffer from it because a strong plant can probably take a certain amount of pests eating away at them unless it's a proper infestation of spider mites but in general if you can sort of just do a little bit of care keep the leaves clean keep the humidity high hopefully you can keep the pests down in my greenhouse in the summer it gets so much hotter and i i suffer from it really bad i just can't deal with the spider mite i can't keep the humidity high enough um and it is a problem but in here with a higher humidity and the more sort of because they're smaller plants i can keep them clean i don't seem to be struggling with them so in summary all the tips i've given today are pretty much intertwined they all need to sort of be done together with the free draining mixes the water the ventilation the light um to help keep them as healthy as you can and even then some of these plants can be just you know really really tricky so this is my passion and my hobby and i've done it for many years and at one point i had an enormous collection um and i had a bad year when we was doing some building work on the house i couldn't get into the greenhouse and all these things that i'm saying didn't really happen the ventilation was poor i couldn't get into water correctly i had massive amount of rot and i lost hundreds and hundreds of plants and for a couple of years that really threw me off growing them again but i just can't help it when i see in the summer you know mature leaves on plants like this colocasia yellow splash and the el Paleo, also known as milky way the black corals when i see these in full growth in the middle of summer it just they blow me away they're my favorite variety of plants my passion will sort of however this keeps going whether i lose plants whether i don't um i will keep going keep growing them because you know i just love to do it so i'll finish there hopefully you've learned a little something um and it hasn't put you off growing them because i know i've gone quite in depth and i've made it sound like it should be something that's done in a laboratory um but it's not you can do it on just one or two plants just taking in a few of the key maybe factors if you didn't already know um most of what i've said is about keeping plants ticking over and in growth because they tend to originate from tropical plants tropical areas i should say so thank you very much for watching i am going to do more videos on the progress of these plants and then conditions they like as they get bigger and transplanting them into pots or gardens in the summer so if you'd like to watch any of that and i haven't absolutely bored you to death with my passion then um please click and subscribe and thank you very much for watching